a routine stall practice flight, a modern well-regarded training aircraft, an experienced flight instructor sitting beside a student pilot. And yet within moments, the airplane entered a situation it was never approved to handle. So how did a maneuver designed to prevent loss of control become the very reason this flight ended in a fatal stall-spin accident? To understand that we need to slow this flight down and look carefully at the people, the aircraft, and the assumptions that quietly shaped what happened next. The aircraft involved in this accident was a Diamond DA-40NG registration, November 853 Lima. It was operating as a Part 141 instructional flight conducted under a structured training syllabus. The purpose of the flight was straightforward and familiar to any pilot who has spent time in a training environment, aerodynamic stall practice. This was not a test flight, it was not an emergency. There was no mechanical malfunction driving the crew into an unusual situation. This was a planned lesson flown in a modern training aircraft under conditions that pilots routinely consider controlled and predictable. On board were two people. In the right seat was Kristen L. Green, 28 years old, a certified flight instructor associated with Lyft Academy. In the left seat was Benjamin Corbett, 21 years old, a student pilot receiving instruction. Both were engaged in exactly the kind of flight designed to build skill confidence and safety margins. That human context matters. Because when we talk about training accidents, it's easy to slip into abstract terms, procedures, limitations, aerodynamics. But at its core, this was a lesson being taught, a maneuver being demonstrated, and a shared belief that this was a safe environment to explore the edges of the flight envelope. Stall training is foundational. It's where pilots learn that stalls are not about speed, but about angle of attack. It's where recognition and recovery are meant to become instinctive. And because of that stall practice often feels routine, almost mundane, especially when flown with an instructor who has done it many times before. But routine can be deceptive. And in this case, what makes the accident particularly instructive is not that something unusual was attempted, but that something very normal was carried just a little too far. To understand why that mattered so much, we first need to understand the aircraft itself what it was designed to do, and just as importantly, what it was not. The Diamond DA-40NG is a modern composite airframe training aircraft. It was designed with stability efficiency and student training in mind. With its long wings, relatively gentle handling characteristics, and strong safety reputation, it has become a popular choice at flight schools around the world. In normal operation, the DA-40NG is predictable and forgiving. It gives pilots clear aerodynamic cues as it approaches a stall, and when flown within its approved envelope, it behaves in a way that supports learning rather than punishing mistakes. But like every aircraft, it has limits. And one of the most important limits in this case is clearly stated in its documentation that DA-40NG is not approved for intentional spins. That phrase can be easy to gloss over. After all, the pilot's operating handbook does include procedures for unintentional spin recovery. So it's tempting to assume that if the aircraft can recover from a spin, then entering one at least briefly must be acceptable in training. This is where a subtle but critical distinction comes into play. Here's how to recover if it happens is not the same as this maneuver is approved to be intentionally performed. An unintentional spin recovery procedure exists because despite best efforts, pilots can sometimes end up there. It's a last line safety measure. It does not mean the aircraft has been certified, tested, and approved to repeatedly enter spins under training conditions with varying weights, centers of gravity, and pilot inputs. Why does that distinction matter so much during stall training? Because stall training lives right at the edge of the flight envelope. As airspeed decays and angle of attack increases, the aircraft becomes increasingly sensitive to coordination. A small amount of yaw, a slightly unbalanced rudder input, a momentary distraction, any of these can cause one wing to stall before the other. And when that happens, the aircraft doesn't just stop flying, it starts to rotate. In an aircraft approved for intentional spins, that rotation is a known tested regime. In an aircraft that is not spin approved, there is no guarantee how quickly that rotation will develop, how stable it will be, or how much altitude it will take to stop it. So while the DA-40NG is perfectly suited for stall recognition and recovery, it offers far less margin if training crosses into the realm of spin entry even briefly. And that brings us to the moment where theory meets reality. Because during this flight, the maneuver did not stop at the stall itself. It went just beyond it. And that's where the situation began to change very quickly. 
As the aircraft entered the stall exercise, everything about the setup appeared routine. Power was reduced, the nose was raised, and airspeed began to decay in a controlled manner. This is exactly how stall training is designed to unfold. The airplane slows, lift gradually diminishes, and the pilot observes the cues that signal the wing is approaching its critical angle of attack. A key point to remember is that a stall is not a sudden failure. It is a progressive aerodynamic condition. As angle of attack increases, the airflow over the wing becomes less efficient and lift begins to drop off. Up to this stage, the aircraft remains controllable provided it stays coordinated. But coordination is the critical variable here. As the NTSB findings indicate, as the aircraft approached, the stall lift was not lost evenly across both wings. One wing reached the critical angle of attack first. When that happens, the airplane does not simply pitch down or sink straight ahead. Instead, it begins to roll toward the more deeply stalled wing. That roll is the first visible sign that the situation is changing. Once the aircraft starts rolling, yaw is introduced almost immediately. This yaw is not always obvious to the pilots in the moment. It can be subtle, especially during a maneuver the crew expects and has likely performed many times before. But aerodynamically, yaw during a stall is a powerful destabilizing force. Yaw increases the angle of attack on one wing while decreasing it on the other. The more stalled wing becomes even more stalled. The less stalled wing continues to produce lift. This imbalance tightens the roll and encourages rotation. At this point, the aircraft is no longer just stalled. It is transitioning into a spin-like condition. This transition can happen very quickly. The cockpit cues may lag behind the aerodynamics, especially if the pilots are focused on demonstration or recognition, rather than immediate recovery. What feels like a momentary wing drop can within seconds become sustained rotation. Once rotation begins, the situation changes fundamentally. The aircraft is now descending while rotating with both wings at least partially stalled. Control inputs that would normally work in coordinated flight become less effective. The priority shifts immediately from demonstration to recovery. And this is where a simple rule becomes critical. Altitude is time. Recovery from a spin or incipient spin requires three things. First, the pilot must recognize what is happening. Second, the correct control inputs must be applied without delay. And third, there must be enough altitude for the aircraft to respond to those inputs. In this accident, the data shows that controlled flight was not re-established before ground impact. There is no indication of a mechanical failure preventing recovery. The aircraft's behavior was consistent with known stall spin aerodynamics. What ultimately ran out was not procedure, but altitude. And that leads directly to the question of why the maneuver was allowed to progress this far in the first place. The most important mistake in this accident was not a single control input. It was a decision boundary that was crossed during training. The stall exercise was allowed to continue into a regime where spin entry became possible in an aircraft not approved for intentional spins without sufficient altitude margin to safely absorb a loss of control. That statement is precise and it matters. Stall training is intended to build safety by teaching pilots how to recognize the approach to a stall and recover promptly by reducing angle of attack. The objective is awareness and habit formation, not exploration of the aircraft's limits beyond the stall itself. But training environments can subtly distort that objective. Instructors often want students to truly see and feel the stall. Students in turn expect a clear demonstration. Over time, this can shift the emphasis from recognition to completion, from avoiding loss of control to briefly entering it. The problem is that the line between a stall and a spin is thin, and it is not always obvious in real time. An incipient spin does not announce itself dramatically. It can begin with what feels like a slightly uncoordinated stall. A small amount of yaw combined with the delayed recovery is all it takes. Once rotation starts, the aircraft's response accelerates faster than many pilots anticipate. This is especially true in training aircraft with long wings and efficient aerodynamics, where the transition from stall to rotation can feel deceptively smooth at first. Statistics reinforce how dangerous this trap is. Loss of control remains the leading cause of fatal general aviation accidents, and stall spin scenarios account for a significant portion of those fatalities. Many of these accidents occur during maneuvering flight, including training when pilots feel most comfortable operating near the aircraft's limits. This accident fits that pattern. The aircraft was not being mishandled aggressively, the crew was not reacting to an emergency. Instead, the situation evolved quietly during a planned maneuver in a familiar environment. That is what makes stall practice uniquely hazardous when margins are reduced. 
Once the aircraft entered rotation, recovery depended entirely on immediate action and available altitude. In an aircraft not approved for intentional spins, there is no tested guarantee of how much altitude recovery will require. Without sufficient margin, even correct inputs may not be enough. The hidden trap of stall training is that it feels controlled right up until control is lost, and when that happens, there is often very little time left to correct it. This is not a failure of training as a concept. It is a reminder that training must be conducted with strict respect for aircraft limitations, conservative margins, and a clear understanding of how quickly aerodynamics can turn against the pilot. There are no dramatic conclusions to draw from this accident, no single failure, no extraordinary mistake, and that is precisely why the lessons are so important. First, aircraft limitations are not suggestions. When an airplane is not approved for intentional spins, that is a boundary, not a technicality. The presence of a recovery procedure does not imply permission to enter the maneuver intentionally even briefly. Second stall training must prioritize margins. Recognition and immediate recovery are the objective, not demonstration depth. The lesson is complete the moment the pilot understands what the stall feels like and how to correct it. Anything beyond that reduces safety rather than enhancing it. Third altitude remains the most valuable safety buffer in loss of control scenarios. Once rotation begins, options narrow quickly. The difference between a recoverable event and an accident is often measured in seconds and hundreds of feet. Finally, this accident reinforces a difficult truth about aviation safety. Loss of control does not announce itself loudly. It develops quietly during routine flights in familiar aircraft under well-intended instruction. There is no blame to assign here. Only responsibility to learn to reflect and to adjust how training is conducted so that its purpose is fulfilled without creating unnecessary risk. Kristen L. Green and Benjamin Corbett lost their lives during a flight meant to build safety. Honoring them means ensuring that the lessons from this accident are not abstract, but applied every time a pilot brings an aircraft to the edge of its envelope. If you're a pilot or instructor, consider this carefully. Where do you personally draw the line during stall training? And how much margin do you leave between learning and loss of control? That question more than any procedure may be the most important takeaway of all.